Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. Later, some pronostications politically about this year. But first, let's talk about your kids and going to school. Charter schools have been around, what, 25 years in Colorado. We've really led the way to talk about it. The head of the Colorado League of Charter Schools, uh, Ben Lindquist. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And you know her, you love her, Pam Bedeno from the Independence Institute. First, I always do this because I still can't believe so many people don't know what a charter school is. They think it's a private school. They do, and they, they think... Some people even think you have to pay tuition like a private school, but you don't because they're totally public schools. The kids are public school kids, the teachers are public school teachers, and they're authorized by public school districts or the state chartering authority. And they have a charter, which is usually a bunch of parents get together and say, we have a different need, we want to start this kind of school, let us do that. And if you were to add up all these kids that are now in charter schools in Colorado, how many of them are there? Gee, it's 13% it's of the public school population, yeah, so, I mean, 250 schools. Yeah, so uh, this would be the largest school district if they all went to one school district. This is a huge amount of, uh, amount of kids. Yeah, it definitely. Through. It definitely is. And, and each charter school has their own or network has their own governing board. So they have waivers so that they can get out of some of the regulations at, uh, that the public schools have to have um, or be under, and that helps them to be more creative. It's also not a conservative versus liberal thing, although I know there are a lot of people, particularly in the union, don't like the competition of, of charter schools, and they have more freedom, which is we ought to give that freedom to the other schools, but when this started, this happened with a lot of Democratic support. Oh, a lot. In fact, uh, Governor Romer, Democrat, was behind it. Uh, Barbara O'Brien, former Democrat Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Peggy Kearns, a Democrat from Aurora. Uh, she was one of the co-sponsors. And on the other side, we had Republicans like Terry Considine, Bill Owens, and David Devlin, not a legislator, but the co-founder of Independence Institute, the late David Devlin. Yeah. Um, who actually died in a, an a accident going across the state in a little plane to help with some folks that wanted, wanted to know about charter, charter schools. schools, and we lost David. So and now this has gotten to be such a such a big part of Colorado's educational landscape. We we now have guys like you who are the the policy and public interest flax for these guys. This is pretty good. Tell me about what the Colorado Charter School League is. I'll take that, John. Thank yeah, you. Uh, I started as the third president of the league on June 1st, and I've been in charter schools for 22 years now. Uh, the league is a membership organization. You think you'd graduate by now, but all right. Yeah, it's taken some yeah. time. Um, the League is a membership organization that services the 250 charter schools in the state. Um, we provide them with technical support in academics, business, talent development. Uh, we also advocate on behalf of charter schools. I imagine state that's got to be a big, big role on that because the legislature is what opened up the door for this when it comes to equalization, which is getting the same amount of funding. There's always a fight down at the legislature, and so you got to keep you got to keep your hands full during the legislative session, making sure that charters are okay. The legislative session is just about to start. It's going to be a busy three months coming up, and we're relying heavily on what you all were talking about a minute ago, which is the bipartisan support that charter schools have enjoyed. Tell me about the demographics. Who goes to these schools, and what, what is the biggest challenge you guys are facing? Yeah, I actually think that one of the biggest um, stories of the last 20 years in K-12 education that hasn't gotten a lot of attention uh, is the demographic change in the school-age population. Uh, nationally, that's been a huge shift. So we've seen the percentage of low-income students grow from 23% to 40%. Of charter schools? Of all school-age kids. Really? All school-age kids. And we've seen uh, in 2014, our school age population became majority minority. So we now have more non-white children than white children in, in our K-12 schools. You're talking nationwide? Nationwide. And in Colorado, we've seen that same trend, just a little bit slower. So uh, between 2000 and 2015, we saw a growth from 33% of students, um, minority students, to 42%, a 9% growth. And we have 38% of our students in Colorado, of all students, who are low income. What does that mean to, the, to what the challenge is running 
charter schools. And that, that, that is a huge change systematically around the country. So bring it to Colorado and your challenge with these schools, which are largely community-based, community-organized schools. What's, what does that mean for the future? Charter schools are, are at really the right place at the right time. In the 20th century, the public school paradigm was uniform, compulsory, standardized. We could do that because we had a homogeneous student population. That won't work in the 21st century. We now have an extraordinarily heterogeneous student population. We have all different kinds of learners from in all different types of homes. Uh, we have charter schools in Denver where children are speaking 25 different languages at home. So the name of the game today is choice. And it's really about schools serving different learners and families, different communities. This is the part that I've always had this mental disconnect in that Every other part of our lives, we're getting more and more individualized. When we were kids, we listened to KIMN radio and whatever the programmer said was, was going to be the hit was going to be the hit. Now kids download what they want, stream what they want, listen to it when we, they want. We watch Netflix when we want, what we want. We go to the doctor that we want, but when it comes to education, there's still this old paradigm of sending your kid to, to this school, whether he's a good fit for it or not. Charters really have changed that in Colorado. They certainly have, and, and uh, when I mentioned the waivers, that allows them to be a little bit more creative, but public school districts could get waivers also. I think the fact that the schools have more autonomy and that they can put together a unique, innovative program and offer that to families for a better fit for some kids. Uh, you know, it's just, it's an open market as far as different kinds of programs. And individualized learning or personalized learning is really the trend today in finding what's going to fit be kids best and so they're not wasting time and they can get right to what they need. Then, then help me understand there's still friction over charter schools. Here you have government schools that are succeeding, uh, particularly when it comes to parent satisfaction, trying new things, but there's still this, this push of, we, they're bad, they're private, uh, there's privatization, companies are running them, and therefore it's bad. Companies are running your schools, is what I, what I hear, that they're privatized. Can you dispel that for us? 77% of charter schools in Colorado are freestanding schools. 100% of charter schools are nonprofit schools. Uh, it's, that's an important statistic that people don't often cite. And I think the reason why we're not getting the message across clearly is because over the last 20 years, we've talked a lot about choice for parents and for students. What we haven't talked a lot about is choice for educators. And what charter schools offer are new entrepreneurial leadership opportunities, new opportunities for upward mobility, for competitive compensation, just a whole new world of career right, well, so options for educators. Stop that last term, competitive compensation, because the theme of this next year is going to be we have a shortage of teachers, we're not paying them enough. In charters, there's much more of a market mechanism. You're not locked into the same salary schedule that the other government-run schools are, correct? Young people today are looking for upward mobility in return for performance. They're looking for the chance not just to be a classroom teacher for 25 years, but for the opportunity to move up the ladder as they perform, to move into administrative roles, dean of students, director of curriculum, to move into leadership roles, and ultimately opportunities to be part of networks of schools. And the charter school sector offers a whole set of entrepreneurial leadership opportunities that we haven't offered in public education historically. I remember when charters were started, it was the CEA and other teachers unions that thought this was the end of the world. It was going to be terrible. Education would suffer. Uh, instead, it, it flourished. But still, the CEA and school unions are not friendly to, to what, this, what this guy helps make happen. Why? I, I've never understood the threat. Well, I think it's just pretty basic is that most charter schools, most what, 99.9% .9 are not union organized. The teachers aren't members of the union. Uh, as they flourish and grow in districts like Denver, the teachers union isn't happy about that. They want to have con more control, uh, and they don't have the control over charter schools unless they, unless they can exercise that control in the legislature, which they do try to do. Right, because the CEA is an 800-pound gorilla in, in the legislature. But when 
when teachers want to teach instead of uh, being babysitters, these type of schools offer a lot more choice and variety, don't they? Oh, yes. And the teachers can match up their own philosophy of education with mean? a school. Well, for instance, uh, I have a friend that loves classical education. And so she teaches in a classical education charter school. Well, what does that mean, classical education? Oh, it's going to be the kind of the, the old method of teaching the kids. The Hitting kids them with, might, with a yeah, ruler? Yeah, you know, uh, they, they may learn Latin and, and read great literature, so the, have so discussions. You're going to learn about Socrates. Yes. Right. And, and, and tell me about the satisfaction of the teachers, because not only do you represent the schools, but you're working with the teachers. Are they happier at charter schools. I know that they're free from the, the salary schedule, the factory worker-like mentality of, of paying people, but are you going to have the same problem finding teachers that I keep hearing the public schools are going to have? I've been on the, the job public for seven have. months now, and I visited 40 charter schools here in Colorado over that time, all throughout the state. And I've seen Waldorf schools, I've seen Montessori schools, project-based schools, their expeditionary learning model schools. There's just an incredible spectrum of different well, options. Your education people just throw out these terms. I think you just make them up. What was that? Exploratory schools? Expeditionary learning Expedition. schools, yes, which focus on basically experiential learning, not just in the walls of the classroom, but out in the community, in the field. And students get a lot more exposure to that as a part of their basic education. It's a pretty remarkable model, actually. And, and so going to your point about satisfaction, when teachers get the chance to be a part of a school that really represents the philosophy and the curriculum that they believe in, they're not being forced handed a curriculum that they didn't choose, they love it. There's a much higher level of satisfaction and you get people who are passionate about what they're doing and are working harder as a result. And that's the reason why charter schools work. You've been on this program several times to talk about School Choice for Kids website, uh, which parents go to. Is there anything similar to that for teachers so that they have some idea of where they might want to go? I think the best place would be our website, schoolchoiceforkids.org. Teachers can go there and they can select what type of school they would like. If they want to teach in a Montessori school, a public Montessori school, they can check the button and put in their address and it'll come up, all the Montessori schools in, the, in that area. The, are standards lower for teachers in charter schools? That's what we keep hearing. Oh boy. That no, no way. <laughs> what do you mean no way? So a charter is just another word for a contract. A charter school has a, a contract, and the contract has a bargain in it. The bargain is autonomy in return for accountability. So a charter school operates in an autonomous way. It gets to offer the programs, uh, the staffing to students that it wants to offer, but it has to deliver results. If charter schools don't deliver results, their charter can be pulled and they go out of business. By what? It actually the contract itself sets forth the performance requirements. So each one could be a little different. They are. And the big difference is, so a district school can exist indefinitely. There is no charter term. There's no renewal. So they just operate, no matter how they're operating, indefinitely. Charter schools come up for renewal, and their charter can be revoked. And so there's a basic accountability built into the system. That incentivizes performance. Also, charter school students have to take state assessments and meet state st standards, um, or the, the school has to provide a curriculum that meets state standards. standards. But teachers and charter schools are at-will employees. They can be let go. I like that. They can be, they can be fired they can, if they don't yeah, produce, they can just unlike, go, yeah. unlike the other public school teacher. All right, last question. Only a few seconds. For me, the real proof of the success of charters is how many of them have waiting lists to get in and lotteries to get in. Is that still the case? We have 115,000 students enrolled in charter schools in the state of Colorado. We have over 16,000 students on waiting lists for charter schools right now. Wow. It's maddening. 16,000 kids want to have a better choice of a different government school, but they're not allowed to. Ben, good luck with what you do. Thank Pam, you, thank you so much. Stay tuned.